Well, good afternoon and welcome to this second part of our design series. I am thrilled to be with you this afternoon. My name is Marla DeVries and I am the Director of Resource Development here at the Greenhouse Project. And as we are just getting started, I wanna encourage everyone to go ahead and click on the chat uh, and put in your name, your organization, where you're located. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us this afternoon and it would be great to see um, how far and wide people are coming from. I'm gonna jump right into it. If you missed the first session, I wanna encourage you to go back and take a look and take a listen. Um, that one was on community connections and today's discussion is going to be on our shared experiences. I wanna thank our sponsor, Perkins Eastman, and I wanna talk a little bit about, I always like going to an organization's website and kind of doing my own little investigation. And there were a couple of great nuggets that I found going onto their website that I just wanna mention. Um, so one thing they say is we strive to uncover the possibilities of design. They also talk about the commitment to continually learning and growing and kind of changing and modifying as they go. The other thing they said that I just so appreciate that uh, people are at the heart. The design process begins and ends with communities in mind. And I think you'll certainly hear that uh, this afternoon for our discussion. They are a firm with a global presence. You can see that on the slide. Um, and we are just really blessed to have them in partnership for this series and a lot of other projects that we worked on. Um, so thank them for being a part of this today. Want to get into um, the series and the work that the Greenhouse Project does is really framed around these three core values. And I like the image, it kind of likens itself to a puzzle. And so these pieces of the puzzle, they, they fit together to form the comprehensiveness of the model and each value kind of influences and impacts the other. And collectively, they create and, and sustain comprehensive change. I think it's easy to approach a webinar like this on design and assume it's going to be all about uh, that built environment or, or what we call real home. And we are going to be exploring different facets of the physical structure for sure. But I want to encourage you as you're listening to the presenters to think about how the built environment really helps to facilitate meaningful life or what we call relationship rich elder directed living. Meaningful life is really that philosophical shift from what most people think about with traditional nursing home environments really to how each of us wants to live with autonomy and control and purpose. So that's meaningful life. And then the third core value, empowered staff, really looks at what are the organizational practices necessary to leverage that built environment to deliver that meaningful life for all of the elders. So empowered staff shifts the organization from being that task-focused, highly departmentalized structure to more of that team environment with that balance of support and accountability. And so together, the three core values create that comprehensive change. And I think they're the difference maker from being many very pretty institutions to what Perkins Eastman says is that the built environment can improve the quality of life for all. So I wanna encourage you as we go through today's presentation to keep these core values as that context I um, also want to encourage you, in addition to uh, putting your information, your name, and organization into the chat box, to utilize the Q&A button as we go. We're going to be exploring different facets of that built environment. And as we explore a certain area, if you have a question related to that, please feel free to put that in there. We're not going to wait for questions uh, until the end. Um, so with that context, I am thrilled to welcome our speakers today. Uh, so let me give uh, some introductions. Jerry Wallach is a principal at the Chicago office of Perkins Eastman. He's responsible for leading the planning and design of a number of senior housing projects on a variety of scales and levels of care. 
a leader in the firm's senior living practice. He serves as a resource on the design and construction requirements for these types of environments. Jerry has played an instrumental role in helping the firm Chicago Studio build a diverse practice, offering design leadership in a variety of project types, including, including residential, hospitality, educational, and commercial. Also wanna welcome Greg Gotro. He has 15 years of experience with affordable housing, community support, senior living, and residential design. His expertise in software technologies and passion for sustainable design practices supports project teams through all phases of design and construction. Greg's project experience includes a number of award-winning senior living communities. So welcome gentlemen, and also wanna thank Jen DeSalvo and Polly Boland from St. John's who will be with us today to share their lived experience. So I will turn it over to you gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, Marwa. Um, so I'll start out by just reinforcing that this is a three-part design series. About two weeks ago, we did discuss the, uh, or the topic was community connections. And that really touched on, you know, a little bit of the community within the house, the communities around the houses, and the greater communities in which the houses live. Um, I think, as Marla said, that is recorded. It's on the Greenhouse Project website. If you want to go back and look at that, um, it's there for you to um, take in. Today, we're going to discuss more about the shared experiences, which talks more about the common spaces within the house. And then in a couple weeks, our uh, colleagues are going to discuss the most intimate part of the, the house, which is really the uh, resident or the elder room. So today, um, we're going to really focus on really kind of a tour of a greenhouse and uh, a greenhouse home and really focus on the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, the den and the porches, but specifically with staff engagement. We're very fortunate to have Jen and Polly here from the St. John's home, which can add to the stories that we're gonna be able to talk about about these different spaces. Uh, in preparation for this, we actually had the pleasure of interviewing 10 different uh, greenhouse homes across the country. You know, we wish we had the time to share all the stories that we heard because it was really an incredible set of interviews um, with the uh, Shabazims from each one of these. And uh, we hope to be able to touch on a little bit of what we uh, heard from all of those as we go through today. So like, like Jerry mentioned, we wanted to frame today's webinar like a tour through a greenhouse home. I think last time we got together, it was more at the community scale. And today we're going to drill down into really the scale of the house itself. Um, before we do that, I wanted to cover some of the basics about the kit of parts that make up a greenhouse uh, home. Uh, in our interviews with, with the 10 groups across the country, and, and as illustrated on the screen here, um, there's really not a, a one size fits all approach to the layout of a greenhouse. Um, Every home has a different set of priorities and constraints and design opportunities that inform the, the way the spaces are laid out on plan. Um, the principles are there uh, as a guide, but there's flexibility in the greenhouse model that, that really allow the, the elders and the Shabazim to express their personality and their culture throughout the house. It's a fairly simple kit of parts in blue. You can see the bedrooms that are arrayed around the perimeter. They, they encompass the common spaces and the support spaces within. Um, the arrangement of the front door um, is, is largely influenced by the way the buildings are paired on site. So some of these share a courtyard or a patio. Um, others are arranged throughout a community. Um, and some of the ones like the Jewish Senior Life, John Knox Village and Rivertown are vertical models where that front door is a little bit more internalized. So at St. John's in Penfield, New York, which is uh, near Rochester, uh, the homes are paired together. So uh, on the screen here is the floor plan and, and its neighboring uh, house would be to the left. Uh, and the courtyard that they share or, or, or patio space is here on the bottom right. You can see an image of that. You enter the house on the north side here through an entry vestibule. 
it's paired with a, a screened in porch. So elders have the ability to, to sit and watch their guests come and go. And this entry really marks a, a threshold and a sort of a boundary so that as guests arrive, they're, they're received and greeted by the elders and the Shabazim. Once you enter the house, you're greeted by the hearth and living room. You can see the elders uh, you know, enjoying a, a, a book near the fire. You can smell food being cooked in the kitchen in the space beyond. Maybe some elders are sitting at the table preparing some of that meal. So all of these common spaces are sort of grouped together and, and really have a, a great synergy um, with one another so they can sort of trade off one another. And, and you know, as, as a need grows in one area, they can sort of borrow, borrow space from another and, and vice versa. The bedrooms are arrayed around the house in small clusters of, of three and four. And then some support spaces are tucked behind the kitchen so they're a little bit more discreet. It gives a, a different access point for staff if that's needed. Services, goods, trash can come in and out in a more discreet way. And then St. John's has a garage, which we did hear from some of our interviews that it's, it's used a little bit more as a storage space than a, than a, uh, a place for a car, but um, perhaps that's a lesson in, in some of the, the storage requirements of, of these homes. I think Greg talked a little bit about how one size doesn't fit all, and we wanted to share a little bit of the context of, of the Clark Lindsay Village uh, greenhouse home. And you know, you'll notice on this one, it's a little bit thinner and elongated. So to the top of the page, uh, when planning this greenhouse home, um, there was an existing apartment building uh, on the campus, and those residents had a great view sort of out their windows through some trees at a field beyond. So there was a great concern about their view being blocked, even though this was going to be a one story uh, building. And then just beyond the apartment building, there was also a fire lane, which needed to be kept intact. And beyond the fire lane, there was a beautiful stand of trees and Clark Lindsay Village is really known for their landscape and their environment. So that was a must to protect too. So as we got to the available amount of land that we actually had to plan and design this home, it started to get a little bit thinner to thin on the site. But I think what you see is all the, in the context is all the spaces are still there. It is a little bit elongated. Um, you do have some rooms for some elders that who want to be close to the action sort of can have those rooms opposite the dining room or the, the kitchen space. Other ones can be in a little bit more of a private area on the house. But Every, every home has its own sort of shape, size, and space that it, it starts to capture on a site. So in Florida, John Knox Village chose a, a different approach. Um, here in the seven-story building, um, 12 households are stacked together uh, to form uh, the, the overall model. So at the ground floor, there's a common space with amenities like a bistro, a salon space, and other public amenities or, or commons amenities, I should say. So you enter that, that commons floor and then you go up a series of elevators and you're greeted then by the entry door, the, the, the front door of, of the house. In this case, the rooms are arrayed around the perimeter here on the, the north and west side. And then the, the common spaces, the hearth, the dining and the kitchen uh, take up the remaining uh, exterior wall space to, to welcome in that light. So today we're going to focus on the shared spaces. We'll take a tour starting at the front entry and the porch. We'll go into the hearth in the living room and talk about what makes that space special, makes it feel lived in. The synergies between the, the kitchen and the dining spaces. The den. And then lastly, the spa and the salon. Before I get into this, uh, Marla, were there any questions that have come up? In, in the in the chat that we should address? There is one so far related to the square footage for each of the buildings that you've shown. So do you have those numbers roughly? I, I don't have that. Jerry, do you know what the Clark Lindsay footprint was offhand? Well, I think, you know, the first thing we should say is some of these homes are 10, 10 bed homes and some are 12 bed homes. So they are, are going to vary based on that. And I think also when you go vertically, um, you do start to have to introduce stairs and elevators and other vestibules. So those are going to grow a little bit too. But generally speaking, I think 
Um, we like to try and keep these smaller is better, as they always say in the greenhouse project. So anywhere from maybe 8,000 square foot up to uh, just under 10,000 square foot for the 12 bed homes. And again, it varies very much greatly on the culture and the development of each home in its context. Yeah, I would say I actually just pulled up a, a, a presentation that we did um, earlier, and I think um, down to 6,000, just over 6,000, up to about 10, like you said, for a 10 person home. That's it so far. Great. Uh, so we'll start with the front entry, um, which really establishes the first impression of the home and presents a, a threshold for the visitors. That kind of changes the dynamic for, for guests it, and it empowers the elders in the Shabazim to greet and receive their guests, which is a little bit different than some of the other models that are, feel a little bit more institutional where you're just sort of thrust into the space um, without, that, without that threshold. And what you'll see here on this slide is that the front door looks different on different projects. Um, we're again thrilled to be joined by Jen and Polly, um, two rock stars at the St. John's Greenhouse in, in Penfield, New York. Um, Jen, could you maybe walk us through what it feels like and what it looks like when guests come to the front door at St. John's? So really what it looks like is when you come to the door, you ring the doorbell um, and you're right now because of COVID and the pandemic, um, you know, we have to do screening in our foyer um, but you, you're, then you're invited into the houses. And even prior to COVID, um, you know, families were able to come and go and visit the houses as they, you know, please. But we asked them that they do ring the doorbell so that we at least knew they were coming into the house, um, just like you would in your own home. You know, you wouldn't have people just walk into your own home. But it, it changes the dynamic because it's a home rather than just walking up to a unit and walking to your loved one's room you actually walk into the house and then typically we used to be able to congregate wherever we wanted um, for that visit um, and be able to see what was going on. And a lot of time, most visits happened in the common areas for a lot of our elders because everybody wanted to see what was coming on, going on. So the front, it's changed a little bit with the pandemic, but it's still, it's a way of, you're not just walking into the house, you're actually invited in. Right, right. You know, I was going to say there's a unique, unique aspect of most of the green, greenhouse homes that are up here. That's an element, a design element here is that um, most of them all have vestibules. And I don't know if it's because they're in colder climates for the most part, uh, but you know, you're usually allowed that that front door at the vestibule is open, but then there's the next door that's usually the control door where there's the doorbell. You can at least come out of the, the cold. But I, I think Jen, as you were stating, that vestibule served a very great purpose during this pandemic, right? We used it as our screening room for visitors and for guests to our houses. So it did help with that piece of it. So right. we well, also did um, a couple of times um, have families just stand outside the window so that they could see their loved one, physically see them um, when they weren't allowed to visit. We've also heard that some, when they have deliveries or food, you know, it's left in the vestibule. That person does not have to sort of pass through that threshold to come into the house and potentially, you know, um, create a situation that none of us want. Mm -hmm. Yep. As we continue through, um, the next space uh, that, that I guess might see is the hearth or the living room. Um, it's really the center of attention within the greenhouse. It's often the, the first common space that you'll see once you do uh, uh, kind of cross that barrier, that threshold. So the space really reflects the personality and the culture of, of the elders within. I think, Polly, you did a, a fantastic, um, uh, shared a fantastic story in our interview um, with just the way the living room feels lived in, right? It, it reflects the, the character and the, and the personality of the residents. Even in this photo, you can see the elders' feet propped up on the couch watching TV. What else, what else happens in the living room at St. John's? Can you paint us a bit of a picture there? Yeah, right now uh, you would see uh, a couple elders in the living room doing puzzles, um, some sitting in recliners watching TV. 
um, and having conversations with each other. Um, people just relaxing and living life, just doing what they want to do. Um, we have an elder right now that has really gotten into puzzles and she is redecorating the whole house. So she's taking down the pictures that we have had up and um, she's redecorating the house with the puzzles that they've done. So, yeah. You'll see, you'll see carpet in these spaces, yeah. comfortable seating. Yeah, you'll like see- you'll homes see, as well, right. You'll see pictures of elders that are living there and elders that have passed sitting mm -hmm. on the, you know, yeah, around the living room also. You'll find things like the throw pillows and blankets, just like you would in your own home. I mean, yep. mm -hmm. because people sleep in their living rooms in their own home. Yeah. We heard a lot about creating spaces for, for just simple conversations between elders or, or moments like wrapping presents during holidays. Yep. Um, just getting together, you know, in, in small, intimate settings or finding, you know, in this example here, your favorite chair by the front door to watch people come and go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have an elder that every time that the doorbell rings, she, who is it? Who's here? Somebody's here. <laughs> yeah. And we used to have an elder who used to sit and watch for her boys to get off the school bus in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, and when she was distressed, that was a good activity for her and it would help her feel more at ease. I'm going to oh, go ahead. Well, I've got a question, and I think it's more about the the living room. I um, mean, you sort of answered it uh, in terms of furnishing and decor for shared spaces. Who chooses and provides that? Do the elders and care partners in the home provide any of those pieces or personalize them? So I think you've answered that. Um, or are they part of the overall design and owned by the home? Yeah. Can you speak so, a little bit about that? So I can tell you that uh, Shabazz is... Um, you know, are known to go to the store and just pick out what what they want to decorate the living room with. Um, they might choose it off Amazon. They might go, you know, to the local store and, you know, just they they have a feeling like they talk about it in the house and they have a feeling of what they want to do and then they go and get it. Um, we have some staples that we've had, you know, since we've opened. Um, but yeah, every, you know, for most holidays, we get some some new decor. Um, and again, like I said, in, in House 65, there, there's probably not going to be any other pictures on the walls but puzzles pretty soon because there are so many of them. We have piles. Yeah. Also, uh, just one request, if you're sh showing pictures or referencing, if you could say the city and state where that project is located, that would be helpful. Well, I think if you went back for a minute, one of the things that I think, you know, and this isn't just Perkins Eason work. There's a lot of architects who have contributed, architects and interior designers who have contributed to the images that are up here. Um, but I think all of them have done a great job of designing for the context of where this is at, whether it is in New York, whether it is in uh, Florida, uh, Arkansas. Um, you all have a flavor there that you want to make sure the residents feel comfortable in, and it is sort of something they're used to. So I think everybody does a good job of sort of studying that context and then developing that uh, flavor, personality, uh, design aesthetic to, to really create something that the elders will feel very comfortable in. So, and I think personalization is, is absolutely a key for, for everybody like Polly and Jen started to say. So the dining room, this is, um, so I should first state that I, I married into an Italian family. So dining is something that uh, lasts a long time in my family. It's not just about the idea that you're sort of going there to eat your meal and then you go away. It really is an event. And I think in, in the greenhouse homes, it's absolutely the same way. Uh, you know, you can see uh, a, a, Shabbat, a Shabbat at the table back there talking to an elder who's sitting down. They could be uh, planning uh, a meal in which uh, a lot of the elders participate in meal planning. They could be sitting there just passively watching. As my mom said, I'm retired now. I don't do that. Uh, or they could be participating. There are some elders that we've uh, talked with who uh, participate in growing herbs in the garden and then helping add them to the meal. So there's uh, a lot that goes on here in the dining room. And I don't know, um, uh, Polly and Jen, would you like to sort of add a little bit to that? 
I think in our dining room, one of the biggest things is it's the, it's the gathering and the, you know, how do we all come together at a certain time and, and have that, you know, the convivium, the, the food, the conversation. And it, for a lot of our elders, depending on where they are in their cognition and their thought process, it brings back good memories. Um, so there's might be a lot of reminiscing around the table about things that they used to do when they were um, younger, when they had children, what before they had children, things like that. Um, I think part of what happens in our dining room and we don't even realize it and we didn't realize how much we would miss it was when we had to separate people um, because of the pandemic. Um, but the staff really came together and really thought of how am I gonna still be able to do that and be with my elders during mealtime and safely do it um, without being on top of them. Cause we used to, it used to be our table was so crowded. Um, we would be sometimes pushing up the piano bench to get in <laughs> as one more spot at the dining room table for a meal. Um, and so that's changed with the pandemic a lot, but we are able to space people out, but they're still in the same room and they can still have those conversations on um, the prior slide, you saw us making apple bombs, which was a, a treat that the elders wanted to make. And we incorporated it um, that we had all the elders sitting around and they made dessert for dinner that night. Um, and they absolutely had a ball doing it and had so much fun. Even the people that said, I can't do this. It's too hard. It's too complicated. They really, once we gave them the tools, they knew exactly what to do. I, you know, it's, it's, just fabulous what happens around the table mm -hmm. in a greenhouse home. Um, but moving to the kitchen, um, there are some very good technical things that need to be considered here. I mean, you, you, we have, uh, and some things that we've learned not only from our interviews that we went through, but just as, as the greenhouse home has evolved, um, wanting to strike up that very residential feel and experience, um, you know, we used to actually look to use residential appliances. What we've learned over the course of a few years is that, you know, being able to cook for 10 or 12 elders is not exactly the same as a, a three to four or five person household. So making sure our appli appliances are a little bit more of that residential or light commercial is good. You know, when we had uh, refrigerators that were opening and closing the door so many times a day, they weren't keeping food at the right temperature. So you do have to be careful in how you sort of select your appliances, how everything's put together here. But I think you can still see how you capture that, still that residential experience. And on the lower left slide at Jewish Senior Life, that is a combination kosher kitchen kitchen. So again, just responding to the culture of each individual home it's easy to sort of make those uh, adjustments. Some other thoughts that we've learned um, through the design and planning of these of these homes, um, you know, line of sight is really important. So even the way you arrange the pieces of equipment within the kitchen so that you can maintain a conversation with the elders across the counter or so that you can see them putting a puzzle together in the dining room. I think, I think that, that level of care and, and attention is, is really important when laying out the kitchen. Um, locating the compressors for the, the refrigerators, perhaps in the pantry, so that that noise is is secluded into a different room, so it's not interfering with, you know, the elders um, conversing at at the island here. So the big question, Jen and Polly, that people often ask us is, who cooks? <laughs> Well, I think I think that's a little bit of everybody, right? <laughs> we have some elders that uh, may like to come out and um, tell us how to cook mm -hmm. or what spices to use or what ingredients to use. Um, right now, we don't have anybody that really enjoys. They've done that. They've lived through that. They, you know, they'll come out and uh, you know help us. But the Shabazine, uh, me and Jen, uh, I mean, our administrator comes out and cooks. He, he came last Thursday evening and did a big dinner for both houses. Um, they, they, the elders uh, really enjoy coming out to the kitchens and just um, smelling the food, tasting it when it's cooking, when they're cutting it up um, and just hanging in the kitchen like you would at home. We, we have heard through some of the other interviews that 
there is maybe one Shabazz who gravitates towards cooking. And so that person really does sort of enjoy yeah. doing that. We so, have that here too. We have some staff yeah. staff. I think that they, you know, depending on who's there that night, right? So they all have their specialties, right? So there's there's certain meals they enjoy. You know, they work as a team to figure it out. Who's going to do what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've also heard that some uh, some of the adopters actually will bring in a celebrity chef, not all the time, but once in a while, somebody will come in mm -hmm. and prepare a special meal that day as an event that sort of breaks it up a little bit. So there's lots of options. I mean, these are these are these kitchens are capable of doing anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just interject that uh, you know the Shabazim are given additional training, culinary training, to be able to um, cook for you know 10, 12 or, or more people, 14 people um, with with the staff. So um, they're given that a skill to do that. There's a couple of questions related to dining in the kitchen that I thought I'd throw in here. So um, are all meals cooked in the kitchen? Do you have to deal with therapeutic meals such as different textures? Mm -hmm. So I'll deal with that first. So Jen? So yeah, we do have um, some elders who need an altered consistency of a diet and they get the same meal that everybody else gets. We have ninja blenders um, that we we raise the food if we need to. Um, we have gone through, I can't tell you how many in, <laughs> in doing so, but um, we, we thicken liquids just like you would. Um, so we don't buy pre-thickened liquids. We actually buy liquids and then we just thicken them for the needs of the elders. Um, and then we puree them or chop them depending on what the needs. We've had kosher, we have kosher residents right now in our, our houses. Um, so we deal with that. Um, we have elders who are on like low salt um, diets or constant carb diets. Um, all that is put into play um, and the Shabazim really know their elders well enough to know what they need to adjust on the menu to make that happen for that elder. Or they'll know she doesn't like salads pureed. So I'm not going to puree a salad for her. I'm going to get, I'm going to get, you know, carrots and I'm going to puree the carrots because I know she enjoys those much better. Nice, very individualized. And then a follow-up question, do all of the residents eat at the same time or how do you manage meal time? So for breakfast, it's made to order. So it's as they get up, um, you know, they, whatever they'd like for the day is what they get. We have people that get up at six o'clock in the morning and some people that get up for uh, breakfast at 11 o'clock. It really <laughs> depends on the elder themselves. Um, we try to have lunch and dinner um, together. But that's not saying that if an elder gets up at 11 o'clock, you know, they might want to eat lunch later. So then they, they choose to do that. It's really, it, it just depends on the elders in the house. But uh, for lunch and dinner, um, we generally try to um, have that together. So this might be more of a, a design question. Uh, Jewish senior life has a gate at the kitchen entry and others don't. Is there a typical policy regarding elders entering and using the kitchen? Brett, do you wanna? I, I'll speak to that a little bit. I, I think what you might not see in some of these, uh, uh, you know, I think it's perhaps hidden in the in the Clark Lindsay Village model here, but we do try to um, provide a level of safety so that when meals are being prepared, that, that there is a bit of a, a guard or, or, or barrier there. Um, uh, you know, in the case of Clark Lindsay, it's it's hidden. Uh, perhaps in Jefferson County, it's it's a it's a different um, condition there. But but thinking about that safety and and when the ovens are on and or off is is you know part of the planning of that space. I would also mention that there are some some jurisdictions where the code might come into play, and and you know the local uh, or county uh, health officials may have an opinion on that or a strong opinion or an opinion on that. And so that might also be driving that a little bit. Jen or Polly, do you have any ex experience with elders? It sounds like they're pretty involved. So how do you, how do you manage that and support um, that engagement and safety? So I think, you know, we don't have a gate on the other, either one of our kitchens at this time. Um, what we've done is we have, we have an elder who is very busy um, and will come out to the kitchen. 
um, when we're prepping. And what a couple of the staff have found is if you allow him to taste as you're prepping, um, he will, that's really what he's trying to do. Or they'll give him a task to do while they're prepping, whether it's sorting the potatoes, um, you know, something that to him, he feels is being helpful and useful. Um, but to the staff, it's giving him a way to outlet that energy. Nice. And then one just final one. Um, do the bedrooms have kitchen facilities at all or are all meals taken in the dining room? I, I think that really depends on the elder, right? Yeah. So we have, um, we have some elders that would um, prefer to have their coffee and eggs in their room in the morning before they get dressed. Um, and, you know, and then they'll come out later. And then, you know, there's some that just come out as, as soon as they get up. So I think it, it, it's really depends on the elder themselves. The, the the rooms themselves, the bedrooms are not equipped with. Oh, sorry, no, they're not facilities, equipped. right? But some might prefer to eat in their room or eat yeah. at other places. No. Okay. Or on or on the porch, perhaps, right? Yeah, yeah, the, we have elders that eat on the porch. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's it for now. Okay. Great. Um, so moving through into the den, um, the den's a space that. Um, you know, it offers a different kind of space relative to the living room. It's a little more quiet. It's in a different location of the house. So it offers a different kind of view, a different kind of space. Um, it's quiet, intimate, and relaxing. Um, it contributes to that notion of choice within the household. So just giving the, the, the elder the opportunity to choose where, where they want to read a book or watch TV. Um, we heard from a lot of the folks that we interviewed that the space is used for overnight stays. Um, whether it's family members visiting their loved ones or, or a Shabazz staying the night after a long shift. Um, so thinking about the furniture and, and, and ways to help support, um, support that need is important. Um, it's really just a, you know, a quiet, relaxing space for family visitation, reading, watching TV, doing puzzles, game playing. Um, Jen, Polly, what does it look like at, at St. John's? <laughs> Well, right now it's a, it looks a little different. Yep. Um, during the pandemic, we've really had to use it for um, family visits. Um, we've had to use it for COVID testing um, and storage of some of the COVID testing stuff. Um, yeah, it, uh, previously um, it was used for uh, football games and uh, families coming in and eating with their loved ones. Um, you know, just a, a place for them to get away to, but r right now it's, uh, it's used a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Do you see any of the changes that are happening as a, as a result of the pandemic in this room being more long lasting, or, or do you think, you know, once, once we open up, it, it will sort of revert back to its pre pandemic uh, character? I am hopeful that it will go back to yeah. the pre pandemic um, character. Yeah. Um, we, we also, we have a couple, we have one elder that will wander in there when the house is overwhelming yeah. um, to them. Um, they will wander in there and look out the window and just watch what's going on yeah. um, and sit in the chair. Um, and sometimes we'll bring elders when they're distressed into that room just to play some soft music or, you know, get them away from the hustle and bustle. Um, just as, you know, in your own home, you want to get away from the hustle and bustle once in a while and have some downtime. Sure, sure. But it'd be nice to have it back to a true yes. uh, <laughs> state of the elder space, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the next area we want to um, talk about is the spa and salon. So it, the spa is, is in, in one way, a, a, you know, a box to check for the, the regulatory bodies, the health department, the local jurisdiction. But in a greenhouse, it's it's something more, right? It's it speaks to the notion of promoting health and wellness, mind, body, and spirit. Um, it's a place for for residents to to have a choice, uh, right? They all have a shower in their resident room, but sometimes they're not feeling well, right? Or or maybe they just want to go to a nice space and dim the lights and take a bath in a relaxing setting. So it's about providing that choice in a space that's inspired by the hospitality market, right? So thinking about the lighting and the, and the finished selection 
um, to, to provide that, that sense of wellness and, and giving the residents a destination, a, a place to go to, to have their hair done or their nails done or, or just feel special for a day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then coupling that with just some of the, the, the nuts and bolts like a ceiling lift or, or adjustability and versatility so that uh, the Shabazim have the tools that they need in that space to provide the care that, that the elders are, are looking for. Um, so it's, you know, combining a relaxing environment with that sort of the institutional requirements of, of this room. Um, we have heard that, you know, this space isn't used as, as much, um, you know, I, I think in part because of the personalized showers in, in each room. Um, Jen, are you seeing that in St. John's? Is it, is it a space that's used frequently or, or infrequently? Um, we use it for our hair, our beauty, our beautician that comes um, twice a week to do hair, but we haven't used the bathtub very often. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that a lot of our elders enjoy taking a tub bath. Most of our elders enjoy their showers. Um, so, I mean, it's really, it's there though. And we always offer it upon admission. We ask people, do you like baths or do you like showers? Um, and find out what their preference is. Um, but we haven't typically in the past, probably a couple of years used the tub as per se for tub. But the beauty salon gets plenty of use by our ladies. We do not mess with hairstyles and haircuts and all that fun stuff, so. Sure, yeah. You know, I saw a chat about my mic, so I hope it's uh, loud enough here, Marla, but I also have uh, a landscape truck or something outside my window right now. So I'm gonna try and uh, ramp up my voice a little bit. Um, Sounds good. Okay, so we're, we're moving to the sort of connected spaces to the outside, whether it be a screen porch, a patio, or a um, just a regular porch for sitting. And I think, again, I wanna, sort of point out the, the context in which each home is put in. You know, the image on the, the larger image here is in a Southern uh, area where wraparound porches are hugely part of the way people grew up. Um, the one in the upper left shows you a screen porch which is off the dining room and is part of a, a little streetscape where people can grab a cup of coffee uh, with their elder and go outside and um, sit and just enjoy the view and watch people passing by. Um, the lower left is the gazebo that is at St. John's house that is placed very well in between the two houses. But these spaces, we know the importance of getting outside really means to the elders and to the families and everybody. So these spaces allow for that opportunity to do just that. Um, Polly, Jen, any, any, um, any added thoughts there? Yeah, I think it's uh, been very beneficial, especially with the pandemic. But once once it was, you know, 55, 60 degrees here, it was, you know, we had a couple of elders that were out on that porch with blankets wrapped around them, eating their breakfast, watch, trying to watch the birds. Um, it, it just makes everybody in a good, happy place, you know? They and we hear sometimes early in the design process and, and the planning that there's some reluctance to providing kind of a porch or a screened in porch, um, you know, in a cold climate without providing the heat and, 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 and windows and, and, and enclosed walls. But, you know, I think part of feeling authentic and, and feeling normal and real is, is, is being cold from time to time and going out in a blanket and feeling that chill on your cheek from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we probably utilize, we have a lot of outdoor people right now in our both our houses. Um, yeah. And that changes from time to time. Um, so it's used right now a lot um, by everybody um, in both houses. Um, and it's, it's ability, it gives us the ability to even do things together as with both houses, because it's such a large space that we have in our courtyard. Um, but it, we also used it for, visits um, as well for six foot distancing. We use, we put families out there um, with their loved ones to visit. Um, it's really a multi-purpose room. We do activities out there at times on our screened in porches, both the front and the back porch. Um, and we have elders who just kind of wander in and out of the porch. You know, they'll go out to the porch, look around, come back in. Um, I think it really does help that 
elder, especially if they have a tendency to wander and want to go outside, it gives them some safe, you know, a safe way to get that need met without having to have the staff on top of them. And most people, when it's cold, will turn around and come right back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think that's a great point because I, I, I can't tell you how many times during the design when we're building in a screened in porch, they're like, well, should we just put in the windows and make it a full season porch and therefore we can use it sort of year round. It's often a conversation, but you know, I, I think Greg pointed out and you just pointed out sometimes being able to go outside and just feel what the weather's doing is a way to connect people back to the environment. So I, I we do our best to sort of uh, steer people away from building a screen and porch and then, you know, changing their mind because we do feel it's a valuable asset. So, you know, we talked a lot about this sort of in between sort of as we went from room to room in the house on the tour. But one thing I, I, I do want to just sort of stand on for a minute in the power of the share ex experience that we talked about is, um, and, and Jen and Polly, I asked you to talk about this a little bit, but with the greenhouse home and this model, you know, what we've noticed is that it's not imposing like a typical institutional environment. So you find families come more often, grandkids feel comfortable walking in because it's, you know, it's grandma's or grandpa's house, right? And so people stay longer and really it almost creates even an extended family between the families. It does. I think, you know, just the whole model, it creates a, an atmosphere of welcoming um, you don't have the typical um, dread of going to see grandma uh, because you're actually going to a house. It doesn't look so intimidating. It doesn't look so scary. Um, I think one of our elders that recently moved in summed it up beautifully when she moved in and she said to us, she said, oh, I'm, I, I think I've been to this house before. Um, and we said, yeah, you know, you might have been. And she, you know, so it not only helps the visitors, but it also helps the elders to feel comfortable and not feel like they're going to a nursing home um, or going to where they, you know, what they consider maybe a nursing home for them. Um, and our Shabazim, you know, they, they get close to the families, which they're supposed to because they're the one taking care of the elder. So they're the first one to, you know, let the family know when they need something for the loved one. Um, they're the first one to um, tell us when there's a change in that elder's condition. Um, and it not only grows the family bond, but it also grows, grows the caregiver um, bond. And Polly says this a lot in interviews, there's no place to hide in a greenhouse. Um, so you have to be present and you have to be, you have to communicate with everybody that's coming and going um, in the greenhouses, including families, which is tough when you're not used to it. Right. Well, and I did uh, one thing. I saw one of the questions here, and they, you know, this might be a good place to talk about this for a second. But they asked, you know, what is the, does anybody have the turnover rates of the Shabazz or Shabazin in, in a greenhouse home? And I can share that we did do a post occupancy evaluation of, of one of our projects. And uh, usually we go in after a year and, and, sort of, and do these. And what we found was that. Um, they had a legacy house versus the greenhouse home and they could do an actual comparison and the turnover rates in the greenhouse home are very minimal because I think it is this engagement of, of the staff and the connection to the residents. And I, I don't know, again, Jenner, Polly, if you want to talk about that, because I know you've been both there in your place for a long time. So yeah, we still have, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm an original, so I started here when we first opened and we still do have uh, five originals in the one house and three in the other. So that's 10 years um, that, that they're here. We do have, we, you know, I think, I think it's hard. We do have turnover. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, sometimes uh, coming here, people think that you have 10 people that live here, it's going to be a cake job. But being a Shabazin is, is hard. There's a lot that goes along with it, right? So it's very rewarding. 
but you're taking care of a house with 10 people. And, you know, so it, it's not for everybody. Right. It's not for people that are used to traditional nursing homes that, you know, don't want that added extra um, responsibility. Um, but we do have um, a lot of uh, staff that has been here since the beginning. I'll say, you know, being a part of this webinar series so far has, has been, you know, incredibly rewarding meeting folks like Jen and Polly. It's just, it's been incredible, really. I'm um, hearing the, the passion and the commitment. It just comes through. And I, I'm, I'm sure everyone on the call today um, um, can attest to that as well. Um, a couple of takeaways for, for today's session. Um, I think first, uh, you know, the flexibility within the greenhouse model. Um, it's not about creating boundaries and, 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 and guide rails um, that you have to follow. You know, not everything's black and white. Um, it allows for the culture and the personality to be expressed um, throughout the house. Um, and like Jen and Polly just, just um, articulated quite nicely, it's just the strength of the Shabazim um, really shines through. It, it's what makes um, the, the house a, a house. Um, now you, you can arrange the spaces in a variety of different ways, but at the end of the day, it's the Shabazim that, that hold it all together. And when you pair these two together, what you have is uh, you know, life experiences that, that feel authentic, they feel normal, they feel real. It feels like home, right? And that's, that's what we're trying to do here is, is create spaces for empowered staff and, and a sense of real home. So Marla, back to you. Yeah, and there's quite a few questions and I just love everything that has been shared. And you know, Greg, when you talked about that that normalcy and kind of the, the right to feel cold. I think, you know, that's just, that, that's just so true. And at Greenhouse, we talk about that power of normal. So I'm gonna jump in. There's a couple questions related to, I'll kind of work backwards from the porch area. So um, how deep are the porches? And then how do you deal with um, security and the risk of an elder uh, leaving um, or an elopement. So can you talk about that? I'll take the first part. I mean, I, I think it's important to plan the porch um, for real furniture, right? You know, I, I think in some neighborhoods, you'll you'll find a five foot, six foot porch just for the aesthetics of it. But if you want the elders to use it, it really needs to be more in the, you know, eight, 10, maybe even 12 foot depth so that you can fit a table and some chairs. Um, there's wheelchairs and walkers in, 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 in these houses. So just Kind of paying attention to those space requirements as well. Jerry, anything to add to that? No, I think that's right. I mean, we've been sort of describing them more as outdoor rooms now and not just mm -hmm. porches or patios because you really do have to provide enough room for, their, for them to be really useful. And I think you can see it in the way the furniture is laid out here, whether it's on the porch on the big image where people can walk by when people are sitting in the rockers or in the upper left image where you can get a table for four people in another chair where elders can go out there and enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning or some food. So I, I think, you know, don't, don't make it so small that it just doesn't function. And maybe Jen and Polly, since you have a shared courtyard space, do you want to speak to the second part of that, the sort of security aspects, how you manage that at St. John's? So we typically will, I mean, we'll have staff go out with the elders. Some elders are deemed independent out in the courtyard and can go out in the courtyard without them. Our courtyard is completely fenced in. Um, that doesn't mean that it's, that you can't get out of it because you could, but we do have elders who need supervision out there because of the risk of them um, maybe wandering off the property or out the gate or something. The gates are locked, but they get unlocked. They get, people forget to lock them back up. Um, and as far as the porches, our porches are screened in. And Polly, maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think originally they were not, right? Yeah, so our front porch, our back porch has been screened in, but our front porch um, was not when we first opened. Um, and we had a man that literally, that jumped the fence. Um, to, you know, it was, it was a nice height, your waist high, um, but his loved ones were, were leaving and he wanted to get in that car too. So he just, you know, put his legs over and, and, <laughs> and tried to go with them. Um, so we did screen it in. I think that, um, I don't think they've lost anything for, with having the screen uh, in the porch. And I think that for the, really with the bugs and everything, it's actually been nicer <laughs> um, that we did it. But um, 
I think just looking at all that definitely when doing it. Nice. There's a couple questions related to pets. And I know you, you guys have a story there. So you want to share are pets allowed and how have you used pets? So, yeah, we, we actually had, um, we, um, we rescued a dog, Lexi, um, a few years ago, probably six years ago, uh, a pretty big bull, massive <laughs> in house 75. Uh, we had to, um, you know, all the elders sat at the table and talked about getting a dog and staff wanted to do it. And we actually had one elder that it was, we really had to talk to about what, what would we, what, what could we do to make it okay with you to have a dog in the house? Cause she was 94, 95 and never had an animal before. And so she said, well, if you make sure that, you know, the dog leaves me alone, <laughs> then I'll be okay with it. And actually once, uh, Lexi was here, um, Dorothy was like, that was her dog. So, um, she fell in love with them and, uh, you know, the, the staff and the elders like to take him out for a walk. They'd, you know, he'd go in the backyard. We, it, it was, there was challenges. He was a bigger dog and, um, we have, we live in a community. So we, we let him out in the morning in the courtyard and, you know, be barking at all the, the families and stuff walking by and it would just be like at home. <laughs> But um, the, having a dog in the house was very uh, special, especially um, when we had people that were passing away. Uh, Lexi made us, you know, made the rounds to the rooms and um, almost knew with a couple people, you know, would just lay in there and wouldn't want to leave the room, wanted to stay with them. And um, so the other house has had uh, goldfish. Um, that's about as far as they went. And, um, and they don't have that anymore either, but um, it was another, I mean, we had elders that didn't even want a fish, you know, that they, they have dementia. So they, they're a little confused about having fish and what they were going to have to do. We had to tell one, you know, the same thing, like what, what would, what could we do to make it okay with you if we get fish, right? And she's like, well, as long as you don't make me eat it. And as long as you don't put me in the fish tank. And it's like, we'll never do that. Like, you know what I mean? But in her mind, she had dementia in her mind that could happen. So once we said that wouldn't happen, as long as we get a census through the whole house, um, then we can, then we can get the animal or the pet. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go through a couple more um, spaces. Do, are there ever spaces planned for a family member to spend the night? Um, so out of town family or to also support staff that might need to stay. So we use, our rooms are fairly large um, and we have a fold away bed um, for both houses that elders families can stay right in their room if they choose to. Um, we, we've done it. We've had it happen. We used to have before pre-pandemic, we had a husband who would spend once a week. He would sleep um, on the fold away bed um, one, one night a week and spend the night with his wife because they've been married for so long and they haven't been apart. Um, and then we have um, inflatable mattresses that we've brought out and put in the dens for the staff when they've had to sleep over. Um, so, I mean, we use the space we're given. Um, most families, especially end of life, like to be here and don't want to leave. Um, so having the fold away bed is nice for them because they're able to get a little bit of rest, but also feel like they're present there for their loved one. All right, there's a lot more, but I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I think this would be a good one, um, probably uh, Jerry or Greg to speak to. In the common areas, how is sound control? It can get noisy in lar large open spaces with a lot of hard surfaces. So how have you kind of mitigated that? That's, that's a good question. I, you know, I, there's a, a lot of different ways you could address acoustics um, in places like the corridors or the common spaces. Carpeting plays a big role in that. So thinking about, you know, the, the corridors and, and when uh, equipment or, or carts are rolled down the corridor, maybe carpet's a better solution to help mitigate some of that. Um, durability is a concern there. So, you know, choosing the right, right product is, is important. Ceilings are another big uh, contributor to that. So where can we position acoustic tile to absorb some of that sound and balance that with the aesthetics of a, a 
you know, a drywall ceiling? I think it's a great question too, because I think we all know that the elders uh, can sort of feel a great amount of frustration if they can't hear or communicate or that. So I think, yeah, it's a great thing for everybody to keep in mind. And I, we even talked about how the kitchens with the compressor sound and things like that. I, so I think you really have to look at it very holistically when you, whether it's lighting, acoustics, all those things have to be taken. Even the volume of the space can play a big role in that. So, you know, we want these big grand open spaces, but being mindful that that, that can contribute to, you know, a live sound and it's sort of echoey and, and, and hard to hear. So how do we dampen that with furnishings, curtains, carpet, ceilings, things like that? Well, there are a lot more questions. I do notice that our time is uh, coming to an end. So we will save all of these questions. And the good news is we have a part three coming. So really encourage you to join us on May 4 for the final session in the series. And this one is on dignity, privacy, and choice. Uh, and so uh, stay tuned. I want to thank Jerry and Greg and Polly and Jen for a fantastic session. Um, so grateful for um, your wise uh, lived experience that you could really um, share with us. We have a couple uh, slides to share with you. So I'll let Janet pull those up and I uh, want to share with you what's coming ahead. So got that. Uh, another webinar that we're going to have on May 11. This is brought to you by Select Rehab. And it's from trauma to tranquility. And so really looking at um, how do we support people during this very challenging time. Also want to give you advance notice uh, to our De Dementia Symposium, which is happening. And I would say it's a Dementia symposia, Symposium like you've never seen. Uh, September 14 is the date of that session. It will be a virtual symposium. And you see the experts in the field um, that will be joining us, as well as we are in the process of gathering some additional thought leaders to really provoke um, some different thoughts in terms of how do we support uh, persons living with dementia. And also want to encourage you to take a listen to our weekly podcast uh, featuring our very own Susan Ryan, and she interviews a fascinating guest. Um, check out episode 33. Um, in that episode, uh, Susan interviewed Perkins Eastman, uh, Dave Hoagland, and Martin Seifering talking about the imp importance of design and archi architecture in senior living environments. Uh, so you can get, if you uh, do a search, you can go ahead and get that episode as well as all of the 80 episodes that we've had thus far. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Have a great uh, rest of your afternoon and a good rest of your week. Thanks. <laughs>